So all of this politically correct mantra and the rulings of courts <laughs> about everything, our life, the womb, marriage, sexuality, childhood, manhood, womanhood, all of these, all of these new truths. It's fake light. Brought by the prince of darkness who masquerades as an angel of light. And most of the people on this planet swallow that light up as though it's real. Are you with me? Y'all with me? Okay. All right, so why did I go back through all of that? Because I told you that I was going to follow it up with another message that would bring, watch this pun, even more light upon the topic. So we're going to go back to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. And we're going to look through at least the first 14 verses there. And we're going to hear some eternal truth once again. And we'll shine some, please forgive me, I'm going to use the word light a lot this morning. We'll shine some light on it. I'm not trying to be corny or funny, but it just, you'll see in just a few moments. And then we'll understand even more about life and death and eternity and our purpose here. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And through him, who is that? Well, the word that was with God. And we now, we know in a few moments, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. And through Jesus and through Yeshua, through him, all things were made. Without Yeshua, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of men. And I'm going to put the word true light because that's what it means. The true light of men. Now that light shines in the darkness, <laughs> but the darkness has not understood it. Now this John, who is the disciple, writes about another man, John, who would be John the Baptist in these next few verses. Now there came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. That would be John the Baptist, of course. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light. By the way, that's our job also. I said, by the way, that's our job also, Amen. to be a witness concerning the light of God's word and the light of Jesus Christ and who he is. But after this morning, you should be able to witness to that in a much deeper and much more profound way. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all men might believe. Now, he himself was not the light, that is John the Baptist. But John the Baptist came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every human being was coming into the world. And he was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. And by the way, this did not surprise him. This was the plan from heaven's throne. He, they, you know, Jesus knew it would be this way. That's why he came. So, so John's not saying, you know, like, oh, poor Jesus. No, he's saying, oh, poor humanity. Poor us. Not poor Jesus. Poor us. So he came unto his own, and his own did not receive him. Yet, see, this is why he came. To all who did receive him, and he knew some would. To those, and I pray it's you, folks. I pray it's all of you. But that's between you and the Lord. For those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. In the Hebrew version of the Greek scriptures, it says to become B'nai Elohim. In the 
Hebrew, that's often translated the sons of God. And that's not a misogynistic translation. It just means, see, angels are called the sons of God. Adam and Eve were called the sons of God. That is, the divine nature of who we were before the fall are called B'nai Elohim. Our, our brothers in creation are the, is the angelic realm, the unfallen realm. The B'nai Elohim. Does that make sense? And so what we're being told here is when we come to Jesus in the light, in the true light that we're reborn we're rebirthed wow where does that term come from born again and 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 now our divine nature is restored to us peter says in first peter i think it's chapter four he says and so when you have escaped the corruption of this world through jesus christ god restores your divine nature to you. That word divine doesn't mean we become some kind of a God, capital G, or anything like that. It just simply means it's like it was meant to be from the beginning. No more pain, no more death, no more crying, no more mourning, no more corruption. All things have become new, and everything has been restored. But it begins first with our own hearts, our own minds, our own bodies, our own souls, filled with corruption of this world, the fake light that has been shining on us, the rat poison that we've been consuming, has to be cleansed. And it can only be burned out of us by the real light. And that's what births us again, the light of the Holy Spirit of God. Is all this making sense? I'm speaking biblically, and for those of you that are students of the Word, and I know some of you are brand new to the Word, and I'm not talking down to you, I'm just saying, I know that there are all manner of depths of, of people here, and I'm trying to speak to all of you. That's why I'm using some imagery so that everybody here gets it. And for those of you that are in the Word, you can even in your mind and soul attach scriptures to what I'm saying. We'd be here for an hour if I did that with everything that I'm bringing to you this morning, but I think you understand what I'm saying. So, so to those who came to the true light, to them he gave the right to be called B'nai Elohim. Children not of natural descent, that is, no, he's not, not, not talking about childhood between like a man and a woman. Not of human decision or of a husband's will, but born of God who wraps himself in light, the Bible says. God who is light. So who's this on the face of the earth? Light has come into the world. Who is he? In the beginning was the word. The word what? Let there be. The word. And that word was with God. And that word at the same time was God. Look at the next verse 14. And the word... This eternal word from the beginning and before the beginning. The Alpha, the Omega, the Aleph, the Tav, the first, the last. And who is to come? The word, that word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory. What is his glory? The light, the light. He wraps himself in Shekinah glory. We know that Hebrew word, right? It's light. He wraps himself in that glory. We have seen that glory to the best that we can comprehend it. In that word that became flesh, we have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only Yahweh Elohim, the great I am. And he came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Are you with me so far? Now, that little bit right there is almost a seminary course. In fact, you ought to get credit for it. Babylonians, Chaldeans, okay, okay. Chasdim, <laughs> light, wrapping himself in light. Who is God? The Trinity. He's the Word. He was with the Word and the Word. And the Word became flesh. Who is Jesus? He is. He is the exact representation of his being. He's the Word that has become flesh. How are we saved? We're saved by being born again. How? By coming to the true light and escaping the... Okay, all of you now are graduates of Carl Gallup Seminary. Well, not all of you. Some of you are sleeping, but the rest of you are. <laughs> I'm kidding. Okay, now follow me. So you have all of those truths. 
Now, I'm going to step back a minute, and I'm going to speak of something. As I said, for those of you who've heard it, I've spoken of it here before, so don't, don't think, oh, poor Carl, he's repeating himself. <laughs> no, I, I know what I'm doing this morning. <laughs> By the way, I had an hour of my life stolen from me last night. How about y'all? Okay, so if I do kind of stumble and mumble and repeat myself, then I'm going to blame it on that. Okay. So, I'm going to back up just a little bit. Now, I'm going to delve into an area um, of science, and I don't want you to think that, that, you know, that I think that I am a scientist or that I'm all that. I, I, I'm not. I've just read and studied this enough that I can speak to it in, in a layman's way that helps anybody understand it. And I can tell you, for those of you that will know much more than what I'm going to share, um, I have had in this congregation for years, he's passed on and been gone with the Lord now, a, a physicist and a physics teacher and professor who taught in schools all over Walton County for many, many years. And he taught the things that I'm going to teach except at much, much deeper levels. And he was here one time when I was sharing what I'm going to reshare with some of you and share with others of you. And folks, please remember, sometimes when I repeat these deep truths, you know, and I bring them and please remember, I'm doing that because we always have new people here and now we have a whole new world in front of us. And some of them will know this, but many of them may not have ever heard this or made this connection. So I thank you for your patience. But this is important. But he told me at the end of the service, he came up to me. I did, I did not even know that that was his background at the time. He was relatively new to the church, and he came up, and he just, he started, he, he was just, I'm not going to get into what he said because it would sound self-serving, but he was complimenting me and showering praise upon me for my description of it all. And I wanted, and I was thinking, well, well, who are you to know all of this anyway? And then he says, that's what I do for a living is to teach this stuff. And then he said some more things that are embar too embarrassing for me to even say, so I won't. Okay, I will. No, no, I'm got, I, I won't, I won't, I won't. But I'm just telling you, so please hear me. I know what I'm talking about at least at this level. And that's been confirmed by somebody who knows it at a much, much deeper level and taught it for years, decades, won all kind of awards in the school system for his teaching. So... Let's talk about atomic theory and quantum mechanics. I love it. At a level that I believe everybody can get. And again, I'm not talking down because there are children here that are in school. They haven't even had physics yet. So, I mean, at a level that everybody. And then there are some adults that had it, but it's been decades ago. And so it's just kind of fuzzy to me. So I'm just going to teach it at this level for all of us. So here is how life, not just life, here's how everything works at a very elementary level. Here's what we now know in today's modern science, and for us, today is modern, okay? If this is watched 20 years from now, they'll say, oh, what an idiot saying that's modern science, right? But for us, it's modern. The understanding of atomic theory, some suggest it goes back in the hundreds BC with the Greeks. And the Greeks did have a, 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 an amazing educational system. Out of, out, out of them came a lot of our own educational philosophy, and medical philosophy, and all of that. So they were brilliant people, especially for their time. But they had theorized that, that there were unseeable elements And, 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 I, and, and that's where the word atom came from. It comes from a Greek word that means the smallest thing. So th they, 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 they kind of coined that, that terminology. In fact, when we get to the Bible in Hebrews chapter 11, that, that whole understanding is restated, but now it's stated as biblical truth from the heavens itself. And it says, by faith we understand that everything that is seen is made out of what is not seen. All right, now, I've got some modern science that will go with that in just a moment. 
So this is not a new thought to human beings. But it wasn't until about 1925, a lot of it built on Einstein's theory of relativity and more, and then other great thinkers, physicists, scientists were coming forth. Some technology was being born whereby we could begin to measure some of this activity at what we thought to be these teeny, teeny elements that we couldn't see that made up everything. It's kind of like, you, you know, it's kind of like a, a hair. I've got one on my, my hand. Not everybody has hair on their hands. I, but, I've, but I've got a hair, and if I could pull that out and say, what is that? Well, that's a hair. Well, what, well, what is that? Is it just this, this thing hanging off my hand? Or is it somehow a living organism that replicates and produces itself. I don't know how much longer that's going to go on, but anyway. But it replicates and it, it takes in nutrients and it lives and it dies and then it reproduces itself. And What a hair. Something as simple as a hair. Well, what's that made out of? I mean, it's just not a thing that just popped up out of my hand. It's a, there was a purpose to it. There was a design to it. If you were here several weeks ago, you saw a video of the DNA structure and the replication process and all the little mechanisms, we could call them machines, if you will, that are that go to work. How do they know what to do? They And they replicate the DNA so that another exact copy of that hair, of course, it's rele relegated by age and all of that, but still, it's an exact copy, and it's mine, and it's not yours, and it, and it has my DNA and not yours, and it... How does all that happen? What is that? And what is that made up of? And so it was in the 1925-ish area, which, by the way, is not even 100 years ago. So this is new stuff where we began, and that's where it began. I'm telling you, we're making leaps and bounds even this week around... I mean, in, uh, uh, among humanity, we're making leaps and bounds in our knowledge of all of this. But it, it began less than 100 years ago where it kind of became a firm theory that was backed by a lot of scientific observation. And so the understanding that these structures, the Greek word atoms, these smallest things, were actually made up of even smaller things. And so then we developed the concepts because we could begin to measure the activity of these particular, we would call them particles, elemental particles of the atom. Then we began to understand that there were smaller things. Now, but here's the deal. Here's how all life works. Atoms create molecules. Molecules these atomic structures then bind together to become molecules. And then these molecules create matter. Matter is anything that has mass, that is substance, and weight, that is it's, it actually exists. It's not just a, something, some theoretical thing out here, but matter, something that exists. So atoms bond together to create molecules. Molecules then create matter. One of the easiest ways to understand this is water. It's H2O. Two atoms of hydrogen bonded with one atom of oxygen. Now, not all atoms can bond with any other atom. How do they know, first of all, what they are? <laughs> how do they know to stay what they are? How do they know how their structure is supposed to operate? Because each atom operates completely different from all the other atoms, which is why it takes different atoms to bond together in order to make a substance. And it takes how many? Well, to make water, it makes two atoms of hydrogen. How do they know that? How does it know? And it bonds with one atom of oxygen. And then the substance of matter called water is created. And if it wasn't for water, we couldn't be here. No living thing could be here. But it started at the elemental level of two specific atoms, atom, uh, hydrogen and oxygen, bonding together in a perfect mathematical formula that would formulate what we know as water.
We take it for granted. It falls in great drops from the sky. We put umbrellas over our head to escape it. It's buried in deep caverns below the earth's surface. Our oceans are filled with it. Our lakes and rivers and ponds and streams are filled with it. And every single molecule of all of that is two atoms of hydrogen, one atom of oxygen. But it all starts with the atom, or does it? It goes smaller than that, which is where the word quanta comes from. It comes from a Latin word meaning, well, there's di different ways. It means how much or, or how small can it get would be the way we'd say it. <laughs> how much, how much smaller can this go? So now in our elementary form, as we grew from 1925s to now, we began to understand that the atom was, had a nucleus. In fact, a lot of the early models and even some of the modern models show the atomic structure looking very similar to our own solar system where the sun would be like this gigantic nucleus and all the planets would be orbiting around it. Because now we know that the nucleus is made up of protons and neutrons. And rotating around like planets, if you will, orbiting around are electrons. And see, it's how many of those elements and how fast they're spinning and what paths they're spinning in determines what kind of an atom it is. Again, where, does, where did they come from? And how do they know what they are and how do they know to keep being what they are? Because if they quit being what they are, everything that we know would fall apart and fly off and disintegrate into nothingness. I don't know about y'all, but every now and then I just, I'm walking down the road and I'm thinking, I hope I don't disintegrate into nothingness. <laughs> it's gone. Of course, now if the rapture comes and changes me, in the twinkling of an eye, at the sounding of a trumpet, <laughs> and we will all be changed. Well, who can affect that change? The Word. Are y'all following me? All right, but now we know that even that atomic structure has even smaller elements. And they all have function and all of it works together and it gets smaller and smaller. That's why it's called quantum physics, quantum theory, quantum. How small does it go? How many? That's where we get our word quantity from, our word quantitative from. Does this make sense? So quantum physics, quantum theory, quantum science, it explores the depths of these, these unseen things. And I know somebody might say, well, but now that we can see them, I mean, we're really brilliant. Actually, we still have never seen any of these elements. Well, then that means it's just all made up in our heads. Let me ask you a question. Is wind made up in your head? Have you ever seen the wind? Be careful, be careful. Have you ever seen the wind? No. You've seen its effects. You can, we can measure it. In some ways we can recreate it. In some ways we can contain it in certain ways. We can see its effects. We can see its beautiful, gentle effects. We can also see its devastating effects. How do we know the wind exists? Because we, we can experience it. Well, through modern technology, these things that started as theory, we began to discover how we could measure them or not, how we could experience them or not. So now we know, and we give them names, but now we know that these particles exist because now we have the equipment to literally see them make paths, to literally see the effects to literally see the activity that's happening inside this structure that we cannot see. Does all of that make sense? So, so much of what we're now talking about is not theory anymore. And we're still learning a lot about it. It's like we're still learning how to harness the wind and to use the wind and to use the power of the wind and et cetera, et cetera. It's the same thing. See, it was the understanding of the structure of the atom and all of its effects that could be harnessed from which came nuclear power. 
and how to arrange and rearrange certain elements of an atom to create a horrendous effect like the wind. Is everybody with me? All right. Now what's really amazing is that this pew is made out of atoms that have joined themselves, bonded together into molecules that has created the substances of fiber and wood. And here it sits. And I can sit in it. That pew cannot do what I'm doing right now. It can't talk, it can't think, it can't dream, it can't have emotions, it can't move, it can't animate itself, but it's made up of atoms just like I am. What separates me from this? I have the breath of God in me. Every living thing has the word of God in it. God says, let it be. See, Satan cannot speak into existence anything with breath. He can't even create a gnat. Are you following me? He can infiltrate, manipulate technology and even give that wisdom from the knowledge of the tree of fruit and evil into the minds of humans and then pollute it. Do you see any of that happening today? Is a computer good? Yep. Is a computer evil? Abjectly evil? Yep. What is it? It's like an example of a tree full of the knowledge of good and evil. Are you with me? And the computer can have artificial intelligence and even make you think you're seeing some form of life, but it is not life. Does this make sense? Please don't let me lose you folks because I'm going to make a point that's going to blow you away if you've never heard this before. So, this is made the same way I am, out of atoms and molecules. The elements that we are known to human beings that were spoken into existence by God himself from the beginning, let there be. That's made the same way I am, and there's a world of difference between me and that pew, at least in my mind there is. <laughs> When I'm made in the image of God, God allowed us to create that using the elements he had already created. But you know what? Atomic structures never cease to move. It's not like when I built this that all the atoms in it just froze in place. And all of the elements just quit spinning and quit revolving around the nucleus and all of the quantum elements just stopped working. No. Did you know that this pew at the quantum level is moving at millions of miles an hour? It's moving at the quantum level. But it doesn't have life, not the way I have it. And aren't you glad? That'd be freaky if you sat down and started moving and dancing. And, hey, Carl, hey, Carl, let me talk to you. Can you hear me, Carl? It'd be freaky, wouldn't it? Never will forget the time my grandson, who's grown up with a son of his own now, was watching Wizard of Oz with us for the very first time. <laughs> and he saw those trees that began to talk and throw their apples at everybody. He went running from the room saying, that tree's talking, it's not supposed to talk, that ain't real, I'm not watching this. <laughs> Smart kid, huh? <laughs> that pew ain't moving, it better not be talking. <laughs> if it does, we know it's demonically possessed. <laughs> But I'm just helping all of us to understand that marvelous things that we take for granted. I said we take for granted. How everything came into being and the elements that it takes and the, everything that is seen was made out of what cannot be seen. And to this day, we cannot see those elements. Not see, not with our eyes, like I can see you and you can see me. We can see the effects, therefore we know it's real. And we can talk about it, we can theorize about it, we can draw charts and, and, and of it, and we can teach it because 98% of what we're teaching is just factually true. The rest of it is theory and we're still digging because we're still trying to learn what it is they can and cannot do. But we know they are there. And we as born-again Christians, we know where they came from. Now, 
The next question probably would be, okay, so if you've got this small element, if it wasn't for an atom of hydrogen and an atom of oxygen, for example, we couldn't even exist. And if they didn't bond, then how do they know to bond? And so what is an atom? Well, it's, it's, it's this power plant <laughs> of nuclear energy with a nucleus and neutrons and protons and rotated by electrons and then and now you know there's quarks and photons and on and on I mean there's all of these different elements that we're discovering how they work and how they fit and what makes them work but the question is what holds it together what holds it together because if it came apart as we learned how to split atoms you have this big bang <laughs> so what holds it together unless some outside force dark or good or bad messes with it what holds an atom together well here's what we know there are two main forces one of them is gravity but that's a very light force but it is important force because gravity is, is but what is gravity well <laughs> that's another whole topic and there's a lot of theories about exactly what that is and what makes it. But the most powerful force that operates with gravity and all of those elements that holds it together is an energy source. It's called electromagnetism. Represented in the models of atomic models and structures as photons, where we get photography from, you know, something. Electromagnetism, the common word we use is light. What holds an atom together? Light. The power of light. If it wasn't for the power of light, there could be no atomic structure. If there was no atomic structure, there could be no atom. If there's no atom, then they couldn't bond. And if they couldn't bond, there would be no molecules. If there were no molecules, there could be no matter. If there was no matter, nothing that exists would exist if it weren't first for light. I want to take you back. This chapter one of John, boy, it's powerful. I want to take you back chapter 1 of Genesis, verse 1, and I'm just going to recite it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void. And the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep. You could, you could, you could substitute the word darkness for deep, because the next verse says, and then God said, See, here's the word. Let there be light. Now we find out later he creates the sun and the moon. He's not creating the sun and the moon. He's not creating the stars there. He is speaking forth the elemental force of energy that holds everything together. The first thing he created, it had to be created first or else even an atom could not exist. Let there first be electromagnetism. And there was. And God separated that light from the darkness that existed before. Are you following me? And God still separates light from darkness. And he still wants his children of light to be separated from darkness. Because in God there is no darkness. He wraps himself in light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. John said, and here was light coming into the world. And this light was the light. It was the life of mankind. It was our life. If that light didn't exist, we couldn't exist. God is light. If he didn't exist, nothing would exist. And you might say, well, that's pretty obvious. Well, you'd be surprised how many people that's not obvious to. Even people that call themselves Christians. Yeah. 
You say, yeah, but does the Bible say that, uh, that somehow, somehow, I mean, if he's that light and light holds everything together, and if it wasn't for that, then the, does the Bible even address that? Colossians chapter 1. And Jesus is the image of the invisible God, and through him all things were created. Everything, whether seen or unseen, was created by him and for him and through him. Through him, everything that, ha that was made was made. And in him, all things hold together. Amen. There it is. We didn't discover that there was a force that held everything together at the subatomic level in just the last several decades. Six to 10,000 years of human history. And we did not know that as a fact. Yet the word of God in the very first verse tells us, in the very first two or three verses, God created, there's the power, the heavens, there's space, and the earth, there's matter. In the beginning, there's time. God created, there's energy. The heavens, there's space. And the earth, and then you'll find out later everything in it, there's matter. The four basic elements of cosmology, the science of everything that is, are in the first verse of the Bible written thousands of years ago. And then we run right into the truth. God is light. He wraps himself in light. That's why he can rearrange. That's why at the rapture, he can change us all. How's he going to do that? By speaking. And God speaks. And there was light. Light holds everything together. God took dirt that he created. How did he create it? With atoms that became molecules that were molded together in just the right way to be dirt, which would make up a lot of the basic elementary makeup of our own physical bodies. And then God would breathe his breath and he would speak and it would become a living being. I don't know about y'all, but sometimes we make God way too small in our minds, don't we? He is light in all things, hold together in him. That's why throughout the New Testament, he tells us, and if you're in me, you are light. You are the light of the world with me. You are magnifying my glory. And no light should be put that's on a hill should have a bushel basket be put over it. Rather, that basket taken off, it be set up on the hill so that he gives light to everything around it. Amen? A lot of Christians have put their lights out or they've hidden them because they want to be politically correct. If they're behind the walls of a safe church with a bunch of people that agree with them, they can amen and they can have fun and the preacher and everybody, but you go out there, put the light out. Are you a Christian? Well, yeah, most of the time. What, what do you think is the definition of marriage? Don't, don't ask me that. Somebody won't like me. What about a child in a mother's womb? A turtle egg on the beach? You step on that, you go to prison. What should happen to somebody? Don't ask me that. Instead, we cave to the false light of the world. Satan who masquerades as a messenger of light, but it's Ur of the Chaldees. It's the Ur of the Chaldees. And we've been called to cross over from that, to come out of that. The light is God. The light is Jesus Christ. The light is in us. Every atom of my body is held together with light. And in Jesus, who is pure light, who arranged the molecules such that he took on a body and appeared to us. 
somehow it's mystical to us, it's supernatural to us, but it's elemental to God. Somehow he dwells within us by his Holy Spirit. That's why the Bible says, know you not that you are the temple of God? Your body is the temple of God. You were bought with a price. You were not your own. Therefore, flee from the light, which is really darkness of this world and all the filth that goes with it. Flee from it. Is all of this making better sense now? <sighs> okay. Let me read this to you. I seldom read things to you, but when I do, hopefully they're powerful enough that you'll be glad that I read it. Some of you might have seen this that comes right out of Christian Headline News. Title is, Only 4% of Christian Parents Have a Biblical Worldview Now. I've been here a long time with you. Several decades ago, we started way, way up in the upper percentages. 60, 70, 80% of Americans. It's been coming down and down and down and down. Two years ago, well, let's go back to three or four years ago, it was 10% and we all went, <gasps> two years ago it dropped to 6% and we said, well, we're done. This week, it's 4%. But I want you to hear this. See, the light's going out, guys. It's happening quickly. I don't set dates, don't have a clue. But it's going out, and we are the light that's left. But we can't be if we're going, don't tell me that. I don't hear that. It's not convenient. I live in Milton. We got things to do in Milton. Are y'all following me? I've been here long enough to see it. We can't come church. We got ball game. We can't come to church. It's a little too cold this morning. It's raining. But now I can sit on a deer stand for 14 hours. <laughs> that preacher, he's talking about that stuff. I'm going somewhere where I can be fed. <laughs> you know why you're laughing? Because you know it's true. Yeah. You've heard it. You've seen it. And from time to time, we have also lived it ourselves. And it's embarrassing to us, isn't it? I said we. I'm including myself. I'm not Mr. Perfect up here. Pull off my shirt. I don't have a great big old S for Superman. I do have one that stands for stupid. <laughs> Pam makes me wear it every now and then, right before she puts me in the corner. That's the title of it. Listen to this. Less than 5% of American parents, I know it says four, but listen, who claim to be Christians possess a biblical worldview. Less than 5%. Find out later, it's four. A new research out of Arizona Christian University found. It's the uh, Barna Research Group. The research also showed most parents today hold to a syncristic, syncretists, syncretistic, syncretistic. That's a little hard word. I'm sorry. I know what it means, but I was looking at the word and I, the pronunciation. The pronunciation escaped me. <laughs> syncristic belief system that blends multiple worldviews. That is, are you a Christian? Yeah. Well, do you think Jesus is the only way to heaven? Well, probably not. Probably, you know, if you really, I mean, if you believe in a God somewhere, you'll probably get, to, okay, that's a synchristic worldview. Now you're bringing in paganism and Hinduism and Buddhism and whatever, and you're bringing it in and say, but I'm a Christian. No, you're not. No, you're not. <laughs> How dare you judge me? Uh, I, I judge you according to what God's word says. How's that? I'm not your judge. The word of God is. But I can read and I can preach it. I can teach it in context. So therefore, it becomes your judge. And if you don't believe Jesus is the only way to salvation, you are not born again. It's as simple as that. How dare you? Yes, how dare me? Because I'm not one that's going to go... I want you to like me, so I'm going to lie to you so you can spend eternity separated from God in hell forever because at least you like me. Are you with me? I keep reading. The study released Tuesday by University's Cultural Research Center found that only 2% of all parents of pre-teens in the United States possess a, possess a biblical worldview. Now listen, 2% of all the parents of preteens, less than 
have a biblical worldview. Now, although two-thirds of those parents are self-identified as Christians, so you got all of these parents who have preteens in the United States, and two-thirds of them will say, we're Christians. So then they ask those, how many of you have a worldview? Only 4%. That means 96% of all the parents with kids in the United States will say, I don't believe Jesus is the only way, or, and or. I, I don't believe the Bible is the only word of God, and or. I think a turtle egg is just as, is, is more valuable than what's in a womb. That's a mother's choice. And or I think a child can have any sex it wants. When it gets a little older, we'll help it decide. And or a marriage can be anything you want it to be. is just whoever you love. And or, see, those are biblical worldviews. 96% of all parents who claim to be Christians who have little ones in their homes right now have just admitted last week they do not believe those things. I am not the judge, but I think we're getting real close to about 90% of them not even being born again. I, I, I don't know. I'm just telling you. How, how can you be born again with the Spirit of God living in you and not know what a marriage is and not know what a gender is and not know what's in the womb and not know what's right and what's wrong? How can that be? How can that be? How can it be? The research involved parents of children who had children under the age of 13. This is this huge thing all over the United States. Every parent teaches what they know and they model what they believe, said George Barner, Barna, director of the research, the Cultural Research Center. They can only give what they have. So if your light around your kids is like this, guess how much light your kids are going to get? See, there are families whose names are on this church roll and they have kids. They should be here this morning and they're not. If everybody that was on the church roll that had kids were here, we would not have room for everybody to sit and look. Well, you know, but it's COVID. Yeah, has that stopped you from anything else you really wanted to do? No, it hasn't. I know because I see them. Well, it's this. Well, it's that. Okay, that's... That's between you and the Lord. I don't look in your windows. It's not some cult. I just know what I see. I'm, I, I'm seeing what I'm seeing. I'm not talking about y'all. Y'all are here. Praise God. I mean, but I just want you to see it with me. 200,000 people live in this county. And there's about thirty to 40,000 at the most that are going to church anywhere. And according to this poll, and I don't know if it extrapolates straight to us, I guarantee you it does with 200,000 people here. Of all the parents in Santa Rosa County that have kids under 13 that call themselves Christians, 96% of them think what I'm preaching is completely out of this world and idiotic, one way or the other. And that's why they don't want to be here. They want to be someplace where they don't have to hear it. Are you following me? And it goes on and on. Now, I do like how Barna ends it with something positive, and I'm going to end it here too. Barna said this, though. He said, look, he said, the reality is our culture is changing, and culture-changing movements can transform a nation. Yeah, ask Israel and Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar. He says, but I can tell you this, a nation can also be transformed for the better, even if just 2% of the population is on board. He says, for example, we estimate that perhaps 10 to 15 million adults in our nation, because we've got 350 million, have a biblical worldview and therefore might be engaged in such a worldview to bring about a transformation effort. He says, a relevant question is whether there is sufficient concern among the remnant. You do realize we're the remnant, right? 
I don't mean hick or hammock. I mean those that are born again and believe wherever. We're the remnant. The vast majority of people in Santa Rosa County don't give a rip about the things of God. Not really. Not really. The vast majority aren't in church anywhere and won't and don't. Well, I don't need the church. Well, what do you do at home to worship? Well, well, you know. Well, we go to the beach and watch the sunrise and we worship the sun in the synchristic, synchronistic worldview. Not a biblical worldview. So a relevant question is whether there's sufficient concern among the remnant to get organized and wage an uncompromising, strategic, and tireless battle to recast the heart, mind, and soul of Americans to put their eyes on the Lord. Do you understand at the most basic atomic level it is the word of Jesus Christ that holds us together. That's why I often say the next breath we take is his word. The next beat of our heart. What's your heart made of? Atoms and molecules. What holds it together? Light. Ultimately, what is the light? Who is it? It is Jesus. It is God. How can you say he created it? What does that mean? That means there was no light before he spoke it. Do you get the perspective here? This is who we are. This is what we're supposed to be. That's why Jesus said, you are supposed to be the light. You represent me. I am in you by the Holy Spirit of God. You now let your light shine before men, thereby, thereby glorifying your Father who is in heaven. Because this world is filled with darkness, but the people are running around in the darkness saying, I have seen the light. I'm hashtag woke. And the Bible says, you're sleeping in darkness. It is the spirit of the Chaldees. Come out of Ur of the Chaldees and come in to the light of Jesus. The world's growing darker, but rather than us panic about that, we need to hold more firmly now to our place in the remnant as the light and shine it, speak it, live it, preach it, teach it, share it, witness it, read it, study it. Immerse ourselves in the light. What does the Bible say about God's word? Thy word, O oh Lord, is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It's all through the Bible. It's all through the Bible. It's up to us to walk in the light. It's up to us to live in the light. It's up to us to know who we are in the light. It's up to us to understand that every atom of our bodies is held together by light that was spoken into existence out of the mouth of God in the beginning. And now we have a chance to live in that light, walk in that light, believe in that light, love that light. The light is Jesus Christ. Therefore, Romans 10, 9 says, if we would confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead by the power of light, <laughs> then we will be saved. Have you seen the light? Just, okay. Bow your heads with me.